Now live. All right, guys, what's up? We got Casey Parlett here, owner of CrossFit 760. Stoked to have Casey on. I was just on your podcast maybe two, two, two weeks, weeks ago yeah, now. Yep. So I had a, had a blast. If you guys haven't checked that out, I'll make sure to tag him in a post after, and we'll, we'll probably touch on that a little bit later on. But had a good time talking with him and have him over now to talk some, talk some training. He's got an interesting athletic fighting background that we'll get into uh, here in a couple minutes, but uh, just super excited to have him on. Appreciate you coming on, Casey. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be on the opposite end of it now. Yep. It's like payback. <laughs> yeah. he, w- he wasn't too brutal to me, so we'll uh, take it easy on him. <laughs> so I want to start just, uh, I-, I think training backgrounds play a big role in, in both how we get into our careers, whether that's fitness related or just uh, from regardless of what our career is, the the fitness athletic background seems to determine a lot of work ethic and different things that we talked about. So why don't you start by just telling a little bit about your athletic background and how it's evolved over the years. Yeah, so I uh, grew up, um, like most kids, uh, playing all ball sports, all traditional sports. I um, also did martial arts from the time that I was really young. Uh, I think I started at like three. And then as I was growing up, martial arts wasn't cool at that time. So... Obviously, I gravitated more towards this, the cool sports, um, baseball, soccer, football, uh, and kind of went from playing soccer and football and baseball to realizing that team sports weren't really my thing. Uh, we can talk about that later, the reasoning. <laughs> but uh, and then kind of gravitated towards like the extreme sport, the individual stuff, um, race BMX bikes, race mountain bikes wakeboarded and then kind of found martial arts again right out of high school and that kind of took over from there and then um, surfed always a little bit here and there growing up and that's a big part of like that's my one hobby you could say now Mm -hmm. so tell me a little bit about that that evolution from team sport into this uh, the more individual (laughs) individual sport that you that route you went down yeah so growing up uh, I at, from a super young age, I was way more competitive than probably most. Uh, hated to lose. Like, it didn't matter what I was doing. Like, I wanted to win. Um, came from a family with three older brothers uh, that were all great athletes. A father that was a great athlete. And they never let me win at anything. I was the youngest. So I always had to fight my way. So when it came time for me to be playing against kids my age, winning was what I was going to do and kind of carried through and played on some teams even at the youth level that were pretty good and always kind of took the game very seriously and winning was what mattered to me it didn't matter like that I was having fun or not like winning is what was fun to me Mm -hmm. so I uh, had a Pop Warner football team probably I think I was 12 years old at the time and we had a team that was really good one year and we think we were one game away from going to like the Pop Warner Super Bowl where you like go down to Orlando and play. And they had a rule in our league where everybody on the team had to play at least four downs. So all the kids that had no business really being there, but the parents signed them up and they rode the bench all year, they had to play their four plays. And we were in a close game and one of the kids was in for one of his four plays and basically got ran over by... A running back or whatever and the running back ended up scoring a touchdown and we lost because of it and that was the last time I had played team sports for 20 years until we did a little CrossFit stuff and I was competing on our team for that so 20 years took me before I was going to play on the team again <laughs> a little, took a little bit to recover from, from that one yeah and it was in like more so than anything else it was just like the fact that like no matter like how hard I played no matter how good I did we still lost and we lost because of somebody else and losing because of somebody else is awful. Like, mm-hmm. like there's nothing that you can do to control it at that point and uh, I just kind of just kind of learned real quick at that point that I wasn't going to have somebody else's lack of ability or lack of drive determine what my outcome was. So what are your thoughts on participation awards? <laughs> do, do we really want to talk about that? Yeah, it's uh, the participation award and kind of where youth sports have gone these days is awful. I have a nephew that's played popcorn football for a long time and 
some of the rules that they have. Like, he wasn't allowed to play offense and defense because it wasn't fair to the other kids. Like, that was a rule in the league. Uh, and it's just it's just breeding mediocrity and, like, the whole, the whole thing that, like, sports was that place where, like, it was going to separate people and it gave kids an opportunity to to excel and like to put themselves higher up the totem pole and it started to teach people look if you work hard you get rewarded if you work harder than everybody else you get the MVP award and now everybody's getting a trophy even if you didn't do anything if you lose you get a ribbon like that kind of stuff and definitely it does not work for my mentality and I don't think it's doing anything good for the youth today growing up it's, it's essentially teaching people like I can sit by and do nothing and I'm still I'm still going to get the same thing as everybody else and they get into the real world and it doesn't really quite work like that mm -hmm. so and that's that can, can tell why it drove you into some of the fighting stuff but uh, tell, tell me a little bit about uh, I, I briefly know but your background in terms of how long you're fighting for just give a little brief rundown on the fighting career yeah so I uh, I grew up uh, with three older brothers and um, was getting in fights just in the street like that's just what kids did in those days and um, I ended up starting to train martial arts again just to train martial arts I had no desire to be a professional fighter and I just kind of fell into it in a sense um, I was living in Northern California the town I grew up in and then kind of needed to get out of there and I ended up moving down to Southern California and started at uh, Team Quest down in Murrieta at the time and from there, I was training and essentially got offered a fight, one, got offered another fight, one, and before I knew it, it just kind of took over and consumed everything about me, uh, and it was like that ultimate test of like that one-on-one -on -one competition, and it was everything that the team sports weren't. It, when I put the work in, I was the one in the ring. Nobody else was going to determine whether I won or lost except me, and, and I could get behind that and just the, the whole process of fighting mixed with the whole mental philosophy of martial arts just really spoke to me in a sense, but it also really kind of set the tone and kind of made me the person that I am right now. So, and you fought for, how long was that over span? Of um, so I think my first, like, fight competition stuff, kind of like some low-level amateur stuff was when I was 20, maybe 21, uh, and then I fought, I just retired uh, when I was 32, so most of my, or all of my 20s, and then a little bit in my early 30s, and had, a, had like a two-year break in there, um, but other than that, I was fighting and training consistently. I didn't realize it was that long. And yeah. Then, and then, so where's, where's CrossFit falling into this now, because... <laughs> So I, when I moved to Southern California, I went to school, um, went through, got all my personal training certification stuff, and was, in a sense, training in a very different way than most people at Globo Gyms. I was training my clients differently. I knew about CrossFit, and right in the next complex over from the fight gym that I trained at, there was a big truck out front, uh, CrossFit Bike Overload that was all wrapped, CrossFit everywhere, and I had just came off of a winning streak and lost a fight, got knocked out, and it really had nothing to do with my fitness, but my mentality was, well, if I lost, I gotta figure out something else to do. So I walked into a CrossFit gym, and they put me through a workout, and I went in there with an attitude and an ego, and mm -hmm. basically it was like, yeah, I'm a better athlete than 90% of the people that you'll ever work with, and young punk kid, and they're like, okay, and they put me through some workouts and just thrashed me the first week. And the first workout had that same feeling, like lungs felt like they were bleeding, couldn't breathe, like felt like I was just trashed. And I was like, oh, that's how I feel after a fight. I should probably keep doing this. So that was how I got into doing CrossFit myself. Still not coaching it, still just working as a personal trainer, coaching martial arts, that whole thing. And then the coach there, Jordan Gravatt, uh, was the owner of the, at the time. He's the one that kind of got me my start into the whole CrossFit space. He was coming on with all the CrossFit media stuff at the time. And at that point, I hadn't, didn't have a CrossFit level one. I didn't even know that there was such a thing. Mm -hmm. And he basically was like, hey, 
what are you doing this weekend? And he knew I wasn't doing anything. So he's like, here's an address. Show up here. Tell him I sent you. And he basically sent me my level one. And I showed up and I had no idea what I was really going there for. I didn't know what was what it entailed. And he's like, ah, just show up. You'll learn about CrossFit for the day. And I got there and uh, went through this course and uh, definitely was impressed in a sense, but at the same time not impressed. It wasn't it wasn't anything new and groundbreaking. But the way that they put the information out was super interesting and de definitely learned a ton and then came back and uh, he started being like, hey, can you coach this day and this day? And I was like, yeah, no problem. So I shuffled clients around and then it was, he was getting shipped here and shipped there and hey, I need you to cover this. So I kind of canceled my LA Fitness clients and cover there until I was working there full time for him and kind of had very few clients at LA Fitness. and. I don't even know if I ever really quit there. I just stopped showing up for work and I didn't have any clients to show up for, so I just was full-time CrossFit. That's awesome. So how's, uh, in your opinion, I want to touch on this. Uh, so I wouldn't say CrossFit methodology hasn't, hasn't changed, but the way CrossFit has presented and done and the kind of media's perception of CrossFit has definitely changed over the years. Uh, what, I guess, what do you attribute you know, if you can touch a little bit on the difference between what people think CrossFit is and what, what it actually is. I know there's a lot of people that uh, are, are very against it and without necessarily knowing, and there's no, there's no perfect program, but without knowing all the details of what CrossFit actually entails, there's people bashing it without knowing what it is. Uh, hoping from your perspective a little bit about what, what general media thinks it is and, and what it's supposed to be and I know it's a loaded question <laughs> yeah that's so when I started CrossFit in 2008 CrossFit was a very very different thing the people that were going to CrossFit were predominantly type A personality um, business owners entrepreneurs ex-military firefighters like very much like that focus driven community and you walked into the gym and like when it was time for business, it was time for business. Like they would have fun after, but when it was workout time, like everybody was going to get after it. And the reason that it was that is because CrossFit hurts and um, the whole idea with like the constantly varied functional movements out of the high intensity, high intensity hurts. Like if you've ever really trained at high intensity, like it is not comfortable. So it kind of weeded the week out really, really quickly. The people that didn't have that mindset that I'm going to do whatever it takes to be better. So that's part of why CrossFit kind of gained the perception that it did is that CrossFit is so hard because yes, it, it is hard and it hurts. But at the same time, people missed the fact that it was only hard to your relative level. So... Like, what's, what I'm going to push to physically and psychologically is much different than what a 60-year-old lady is going to push to. But if she's still pushing beyond what she was capable of the day before, she's still working at the intensity that she needs to to get results. And that's, that's the beauty of CrossFit is it is truly infinitely scalable like Coach Glassman always talks about. Uh, and then with that, kind of as... CrossFit started to gain popularity, it started to gain a lot of popularity from the sport of CrossFit. And the sport of CrossFit is just like anything else, it is a sport. And the things that are going to happen in the sport are very different. There's going to be sacrifices that are made to be the best at your sport, to get the best score, so on and so on down the line. Like the sport of CrossFit is not about the overall health and longevity and improving your quality of life. It is about winning, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that is the sport of it. So that's been a big part in the media is like people see the Rich Frontings and Matt Frazier's and Ink Dorisader and all of the other girls from Iceland and Tia Toomey from Australia, like all these girls that have dedicated their life to the sport side of it. And they're like, oh, well, that's what these girls look like and that's what these guys look like. I don't look like that, I can't do it. And the big push right now in CrossFit is the whole CrossFit health and kind of trying to bring the perception back to that CrossFit is for everybody and it doesn't matter 
if you haven't worked out ever in your life and you're 50 years old and 40 pounds overweight, like you could still walk into a CrossFit gym. You don't need to get fit to work out in a CrossFit mm -hmm. gym. You just need to show up. And if the coaches know what they're doing, they're going to take care of you. They're going to scale you down. They're going to modify and they're going to make you push to your relative intensity levels. They're going to push you beyond what you were capable of the day before. And there's going to be somebody working out right next to you that might be in a worse spot than you physically and has a worse overall fitness capacity, if you want to call it that. And then on the other side of you, there might be an ex-professional athlete or an ex-college athlete doing the same base workout, but it's scaled to his relative intensity level. And I think that's something that is very much missed. I think even coaching and CrossFit seminars around the world, that's a big part of the level one. I, Feel that people get to and they kind of let it kind of blow right by and all they hear is intensity 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 and they forget about the mechanics and consistency before intensity piece and that's where things kind of get skewed and you know like just like anything uh, if you work out like an idiot or you coach somebody like an idiot like people are gonna get hurt mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter if you're doing CrossFit if you're doing Olympic weightlifting or powerlifting or if you're doing a spin class if you have no concept of what you're doing and you're not really sure of the way things are supposed to be and you don't have a background in exercise science and anatomy and um, the little bit of psychology stuff that you need to know like you can really hurt somebody and it's it's not crossfit that's going to hurt somebody it's it's your mentality it's your process it's your program in a sense that's hurting somebody not crossfit as a whole yeah, I think too often the I mean, CrossFit itself gets gets blamed, but uh, if you guys are listening, uh, Zach Long, the barbell physio, and uh, Mitch Babcock, he's another uh, Dr. Mitch, GPT, uh, both those guys are putting out some good research, and PTs that are in the CrossFit realm, and uh, injury rates are very similar, if not even lower, compared to like yoga and running and even recreational gym gym goers, that it's it's not the methodology itself, it's its how it's being coached, it's how it's being performed, and there's, like you said, there's risk with anything when you're working out. If you're in a situation where that's not monitored as well, you're potentially putting yourself at risk. But I want to touch on, you, you mentioned the, the college football player versus the 60-year-old woman, and uh, I've, I've been around Casey coaching quite a bit, and he does, you do such a good job with uh, just working with people with, with where they're at, but also getting them, getting them to, I don't want to say push further than they're capable of, but you, you have a pretty elegant way, whether you know it or not, of getting people to, you know, become a better version of themselves without them feeling like, oh, they're just coming in and running me into the ground. And I feel lousy every time uh, that I leave there. And I, I think it's interesting from your background as a, as a fighter and as somewhat competitive crossfitter that to have that, you know, that blend of, uh, obviously, you know your stuff physically, but the way you coach people and what would what would be a you know one or two pieces of, of wisdom for for the coaches out there that are looking to to find that balance between okay how do I how do I push without without pushing too hard is that something that's always been natural to you or something uh -huh. you learned? So I actually uh, in the podcast I recorded the other day I just had this conversation and and one of the things and I actually I'll give a plug to. The, my first CrossFit coach and the guy that kind of got me started and all, Jordan, he uh, had me coach and he knew where I came from. He knew, he knew my personality and there was just like any CrossFit gym and really like any, but anybody that's working with the general public, there's going to be all different walks of life. And he told me one day, like, you're really good with a certain group of people, but you could be really good with all of them if you just learned to wear different hats. Uh, and what he meant by that is like if I have that college athlete and he's 22 years old or she's 22 years old, the way that I'm going to approach them is much different than I'm going to approach the 60-year-old lady or even the 45-year-old guy that's a little bit out of weight or a little bit overweight and hasn't played sports for 20 years. So the whole like wear different hats thing is basically like and the way that I processed it and the way that it made sense to me was if I'm working with that 22 year old college kid I'm going to treat him like a little brother or like a younger friend mm -hmm. and I'm going to talk to him the same way and then when I work with the 60 year old lady I'm going to treat her like I would treat my grandma and when I work with the 40 year old lady I might treat her like I would treat my mom or an aunt 
And then same thing, I have the 45 year old guy, I'm gonna treat him like I would talk to my dad or an older brother or something. And that's been something that just really works. Like if you really think about it, like if you have somebody that's 45 years old, even if you're the coach and I'm only 25 years old, if I try to talk to him, like he's below me, now I look like a jerk, I look like I'm arrogant. Whereas once you give that person the respect that they deserve, they're gonna open up and listen to you. And if you can get everybody to hear what you're saying, then you can actually help. But otherwise, if you're talking and you're not getting those people to buy in and you're not relating to them, now all of a sudden, you're not helping anybody, you're not doing your job anymore. So I think that's probably the biggest one is to, as for new young coaches, to learn to wear different hats, whether you're a female, male, doesn't matter. Like when you work with different clientele, like you have to figure out a way to relate to that individual specifically. And you need to be able to do it back to back to back, especially if you're running group classes or working with multiple people at a time. Uh, other things that help is to develop relationships and it kind of blends in with that like if you get to know somebody and you know what they do for work if you know what sports they played growing up if you just know all of those things that make them tick and you know that oh they just had an aunt die or they just had a birthday or they just did this they just did that now all of a sudden everything that you do you can draw a parallel to it you can start to paint the picture for them in a way that makes sense to them because if I start to work with you and I try to talk to you about oh you need to do this and relate it to martial arts you're going to look at me like I have no idea what you're talking about but as soon mm -hmm. as I relate it to football for you you're going to be like oh cool got it mm -hmm. and that's I think that would be kind of the other big piece is to just really get to know people and just to really care about them and if you care about somebody you're going to figure out a way to make them do what it is that they need to do to get better yeah I think that, sh that speaks for itself and results with members at the gym and uh, things I've seen another thing uh, how about in terms of from a behavior change standpoint? Cause you, you're really good about getting people to uh, give up things that they they might not <laughs> <laughs> normally be willingly willing to uh, to give up on their own. But in in a way, again, I think it comes back to speaking to how much you you know, care for people. But uh, how do you how do you have those those tough conversations sometimes where you know people aren't going to get to the level they want without sacrificing something and getting them to change get that change in behavior uh yeah i think that's probably the hardest part uh, and for me a lot of it comes from confident i really trust what i know and i really trust the experiences that i've had myself and that i've um, worked worked or helped others get through and when somebody comes to you and they're like i want to lose weight the easy thing to do is to be like, oh, you need to work out more, you need to go for a run more. What nobody wants to do is talk about the thing that's actually gonna help them lose weight and that's, that's their food. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not afraid to tell somebody like, if you want this, you can do everything you want in the world, but it's never gonna really get you where you wanna go until you do this one thing. And I think that's probably the biggest one that I work with as people is on their nutrition um, as far as getting them to do something that they don't want. And it's just a matter of doing small steps. Like, cool, you don't want to do the paleo diet or you don't want to weigh and measure your food. Cool, I don't care. But, like, what's one thing that you eat or drink every day that you know you shouldn't? Oh, you drink soda still. How many sodas do you drink a day? Uh, I just drink one soda, but I drink one every day. I'm like, okay, cool, let's just, what if we just drink instead of that one soda, we just, just drink a half a soda every day. And once you get somebody to only drink half a soda, and it's seven days, you can do anything for seven days, and you just kind of build that. And they come in seven days later, and they're like, I did it, I only drank a half a soda every day, and I lost two pounds. And my pull-ups felt easier. And now all of a sudden, that client trusts me. Mm -hmm. And once you develop that trust with the client, you can literally tell them to do whatever you want. Like I joke around all the time, like clients in our gym, like I could be like, hey guys, we're not gonna do this today. We're gonna just go run a 10K. Everybody outside and everybody will kind of look at me like, are you serious? And they walk outside and they're ready to go because they trust 
that I'm going to always have their best interest in mind. And if they need to run a 10K, then that's what they're going to do. They're going to go run a 10K. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think if you can develop that trust with people, you can get them to do whatever you want. Or whatever. Not, I don't even want to say whatever you want, but whatever they need. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that trust piece is huge. And another thing is uh, just creating that, that short term. And by doing that, creating that little short term, you know, a manageable thing that they can commit to. And then once you can tie that in with the results, then it's, it's easier to have those conversations. But I think a lot of people have a tough time. They, they know that's what the client needs or client athlete, whoever you're working with, but it's almost, uh, it's on, if, if you want to bring up that conversation to them and cause it's, it's a hard conversation to have, it's not easy to say, Hey, give up this thing you love, but it's almost a disservice to people around them. If you know what's best for them and you're withholding it, it's, it's yeah. not fair to their results and they can choose to take it or leave it. But. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I just had this conversation with my wife the other day and my wife is very much so like, uh, I want to empower every young girl possible and show them how great they can be and show them that they can do whatever it is that they want. And we were talking about birth control and she's like, I have this person or that person that I know is on birth control and I know how bad it is and they have, have this kind and I just want to talk to them and tell them and I need to have the conversation because if I don't have the conversation and something happens, I'm never going to be able to live with myself. And I think that that's something super important to understand is like, like if you really are passionate about whatever it is that you're doing and you know that you can help somebody and you don't help them, are you, are you really being the best version of yourself? Are you really living by all of the things that you say you do? Right? So like I know every night that I go to sleep, like I did everything in my power to be the best version of myself, whether it was like somebody came to me, like I'm not afraid to be like, you know what, like you have 10 pounds to lose. Like I know you don't want to hear it, but you have 10 pounds to lose and that's the truth. Or you know what, you want to play high school football? That's great, but you're 100 pounds right now. Like you're not playing high school football at 100 pounds. You got to get in the gym. You got to eat and lift every single day. So uh, going back to the the birth control thing, and like as a coach, as a male coach, especially when I was young, I worked with a lot of female clients, and I had to learn and get really comfortable really quick talking about the things that most trainers don't want to talk about. Like when a female walks in and she's on her period or she's about to start her period or whatever, like there's things that you need to do differently with that person. Their emotions are going to be different. The way that they're going to react to your cues and what you're saying is going to be much different than it is the week prior or the week after. Needing to understand like, hey, look, you can't get on the scale every week as a woman because you have a 28-day cycle and your body's going to flush through X, Y, and Z. So if you get on the scale today and you get on next week, like, you're not going to know if you're really losing weight. Let's wait four weeks and have you get on the scale then because then you, I need to be able to talk to people and educate them on that and be really comfortable with it and I need to be able to tell a female like, hey, look, if you're on birth control, your body essentially thinks that you're pregnant right now and you don't have abs, not because you don't have abs, but because your body is carrying this extra layer because it thinks that you're pregnant. Mm-hmm. And once you tell people that and you give, give them that information – you can have amazing breakthroughs. Like I have this crazy picture in my phone of a girl for years. She was a college athlete, never had a six pack and never been able to see my abs. It's just not possible for me. And I broke it down. We knew what her nutrition was. We got her off birth control and six weeks later she had a six pack. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. But without ever having that conversation with her, it wasn't an easy one. I didn't want to do it, (laughs) but I knew that it was valuable. Mm -hmm. And I think once you find that value in something, it kind of, puts everything else out the window. Like it doesn't matter anymore if it's really that valuable to you. Yeah. I I think it's awesome. And for any young coaches out there, anything being able to have those conversations is it's not easy, but uh, like, like you said, it's, we owe it to, you know, we, we owe it to the people we're working with to get the best results from them. And whether, like, like I said, whether they want to receive that or not is, you know, a different, a different thing, but at least being able to raise the awareness and, and in a way that educates and not, not just telling them what to do, but yeah. in a way that educates them, like you said. So I think that's, that's awesome. Yeah. 
Well, cool. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to keep you keep you all night here, but uh, we we could we could talk for a while. <laughs> we things, talk. But I want to start at least in the process of wrapping up. We'll see if there's any questions here in a, okay. in a minute. But I uh, just want to hear something that you know. I, I feel like we live in this world that's so like connected through through social media, and which is a great tool. Yet uh, we're not truly like connecting with others, like like you know, like we were when we sit here and have a conversation and things that don't happen over, over the internet and just want to kind of hear people that follow you, something they may not, may not know about you, uh, something, whether it be a, you know, something big, something, something small with something your followers likely don't know about you. Uh, yeah. So I actually, my, I first started coaching wakeboarding. Um, that was kind of where I got my start. I had a guy that I wakeboarded with all the time. that was older and he was a really good wakeboarder kind of took me under his wing and spent a lot of time with him and he started like a just a local wakeboard school and he needed some help and at 17 years old he started using me to help coach and just kind of learned a lot from him along the way and learned a lot about the coaching process and um, so yeah that's kind of where I got my start was in wakeboarding and that kind of led into martial arts and everything else that I've done. That's cool. I didn't know that one either. So. <laughs> uh, fun fact to learn. So you can see if you have any questions on your staircase you'll see if anything coming through here otherwise I know I have a question yeah nothing for me so my question is we need to hear it on film what's 19.1 have in store for us or uh, or along with that what's a, a bold prediction for the for the open this year um, so I feel like 19.1 should go back I think to 2012 repeat and seven minutes of burpees. Oh boy! It was just crushing people. For people, <laughs> it was like one of those workouts that they didn't expect. And seven minutes of burpees is real interesting. And I mean, they, I think we had to do it with a, like a jump and touch that you had to like make mm -hmm. sure you open your hips all the way at the top. So I want to see seven minutes of burpees come up at least some point. If it's not 19.1 at some point this season, it'd be awesome to see. Yeah. Any other workouts stand out to you? I know you've been around the open for, for some time. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the open, just in general, I think the workouts are such a great test of people's mental capacity more than anything else because it's always stuff that everybody can do for the most part, and it's just a matter of like how bad you're willing to hurt, uh, and it's that kind of gets into that sport side of it. and. Um, kind of blends the like oh we get our results from intensity but like let's see like how far we can really push that uh, so I think as far as the open goes I think that's the that's the best part of it is it pushes people so far mentally that they come out of it every year and they're like oh I had no idea I was capable of this or I had no idea I was capable of that mm -hmm. that's so cool so yeah. uh, let's wrap it up. Uh, where you got a few different things going on. So yeah. where can people find you right now? At, at, at a couple uh, new projects going on. And so uh, easiest way is just uh, at Casey Parlett on Instagram. Um, and then same thing on Facebook, at just Casey Parlett there. And then the wife and I just launched our blog and website a couple weeks ago. And it's just CaseyandNat.com spelled out. Uh, and on that is... Kind of our workout log, our kind of training logs every week we'll post, and then we kind of have a his and her blog thing going right now where I post kind of just my thoughts and just kind of different insights to whatever different different things that I'm thinking about, uh, and then she's doing the same thing on hers as well, and then what else? Oh, and then the podcast. So. Uh, just kicked off the Stick to the Program podcast, and that's been something that's been in the works for a long time. I've been talking about it, and finally launched it, pulled the trigger on it. Um, it was a little, a little scary and nerve-wracking to do, but um, have a really good direction that I'm going with it and really happy. Uh, and it's really just about understanding why it's important to prioritize your health and kind of all the things that come with it. So it'll just be, uh, whether it's an individual, me just talking about some different topic or interviewing different people that have mentored me, um, different colleagues like yourself, um, or people that inspire me, uh, and just kind of getting on and having that conversation and digging in less about what they're 
training looks like and much more about what their what their mindset is and how it kind of bleeds into their life and hopefully people get out of it that they can that they can make health a priority in their life no matter how busy they are no matter what they have going on or what they've been told um, that health is something that's going to help them be successful in whatever else they do yeah so a few places and an owner of a uh... Uh, and across the 760 yeah. <laughs> um, so and that's kind of the big piece is that the blog and website has become kind of my new I guess platform for everything else to branch off of and that's something that I had never had of my own so it was always through the gym so now that I have my own piece everything else kind of comes off there so anything that you want to see kind of my thoughts my opinion on things that aren't skewed around CrossFit and kind of pushing out into all things health, exercise science related uh, will be through caseyandnat.com. Yeah, yeah, definitely check that out, guys. If you're uh, just interested in learning more about, like you said, health and fitness in general, some good, uh, some good mindset, behavioral principles worked in there too, which is which is awesome to see. Uh, if you guys are into CrossFit, definitely have to definitely have to check it out. Uh, if you're in Carlsbad area. North County, San Diego, pop in, check us out, ask questions, pick our brains, especially this guy. He, uh, he does an awesome job with the coaching. So if you're in the CrossFit sphere, uh, make sure to pop on over. Anything uh, else? No, yeah. thanks, thanks for having me. It was yeah. awesome. Keep doing these. Have fun with them. Appreciate it, Casey. All right, guys, we'll talk to you soon.